All right, friends, glad you guys are here today. Last week, we, uh, we were, we're in the middle of a series on Jonah. And to give you kind of a recap of Jonah, uh, we've, we've kind of, one of the things we discussed last week is Jonah is many times looked as a children's story of the Bible. Um, but we, we, we were showing the, uh, why it's true that Jesus even spoke of it being true. So I want to recap a little bit about what's going on with Jonah, what we call the running or the reluctant prophet. Uh, Jonah was a prophet of God that disobeyed him. Jonah 1.1 1, 1 says this, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of, Am- son of Amittai, and said, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. The people of Nineveh Church, the capital city of, of Assyria, they were wicked and cruel people. Uh, what they would do to the people that they captured was, was horrendous. Uh, they were not, uh, <laughs> you didn't want to be uh, captured by them, let's just put it that way. They, uh, they would be unusually cruel, they would rape, they would kill, they would torture, just to name a few. We, we have a few enemies in our, in our world today that, that seem to torture and, and that we can kind of look to for reference. And God told Jonah to go, go to Nineveh, and instead of going to Nineveh, he hopped in a boat going the completely other direction, right? Probably with this mentality of, I don't want to have anything to do with these horrible people. I'm going in a different direction. So God, God then sent this storm. It, it was starting to break up the boat. The men that are in there, the sailors are throwing their stuff out. They're freaking out. They're calling on their false gods and nobody's answering. And then finally, finally Jonah owns up to it and he says, it's my fault. Throw me overboard. And with, with reluctance, the sailors threw him overboard and and the Bible says that the Lord provided a great fish that swallowed Jonah. And he spent three days and nights in the belly of this fish. And last week, we examined in chapter 2 his prayer of repentance and coming back to God and coming back to the obedience of God. And just his, his understanding of that God is sovereign, God is in control, and you can't outrun him. The last verse of chapter 2 said that the Lord commanded the fish and the fish vomited him up on the shore. And that's where we're going to pick up today. And we look at, going back, just a little bit of comparison between chapter 3 and, and where we started. Chapter 1, verse 2, we read this, that God tells Jonah, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come before me. Then in verse 3, what we see is it says, But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Right? We've, we've had those moments in our life where we go the different direction where God wants us to. And we see the initial command and what Jonah did instead. But in chapter 2, we see Jonah in his prayer crying out to God, owning up to his mistakes and his disobedience. And he acknowledges God's control and his sovereignty. And he chooses to finally be obedient to God and his command. Which brings us to chapter 3 today. If you guys would look up on the screen, if you guys have have your Bible, it's Jonah. Chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 is where we're going to begin. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. So, read this with me. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, what? The second time. Second time. And the Hebrew word, just in case you're wondering, is sheni. And that word means to, to, uh, to a second time or to come again, right? It's, it's again. So he is, he is, uh, he's coming to, to Jonah again. And Jonah, this man, this prophet of God, he not only disobeyed the first time, right? But he ran from the known word and command of God. One of the things we talked about last week is sometimes we have those things like, man, I don't really know what God wants me to do. And then sometimes there's something in scripture that says, don't do this or do this. And we do the opposite. Jonah knew what he was doing, but God gives him a second chance. I want to throw out three, three ideas to you guys here. The first one is this. When we think about this second chance, when we think about Jonah and his disobedience, think about what a prophet is. I mean, they're a spokesperson for God. Right. And, and, and here we're talking about a guy that's close to God, one we might call like a, a really big Christian. Right. He may be the Billy Graham of the day. Right. For preachers, if we're going to put our put our brain that way. The first thing is this. Your sin does not have to define you. We need to we need to remember that our sin does not have to define you. Jonah messed up. He owned up. And now he's doing what God has called him to do. And God is a God of second chances. 
And we're seeing that in the life of Jonah. Also, if you're familiar with stories in the Bible, the life of David, a man that made huge mistakes, lust, affairs, murder, cover up, lie after lie after lie. And God used him in great ways. In fact, he began to be known as a man after God's own heart. Then we look at Peter. This is a man that followed Jesus very closely. Right? He lived with Jesus. He did ministry with him. At a time, he even tried to rebuke Jesus. Right? He disagreed with him on different things. He would try to push his agenda against God. God says, Jesus says, I'm going to die. And Peter says, oh, no, you're not. Right? And we see how that worked out. By the way, we're grateful that he did. Right? He tried uh, to rebuke Jesus, and he denied Jesus three times. But Jesus still used him in mighty ways. We see him, he wrote first and second Peter. We see him as a leader in the church. We read a lot about him in Acts. God used him in a mighty way. So we need to understand today, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to own up here, I sin, right? So I, every single one of us sins. And my sin, your sin, does not have to define you. The second thing is this, is be a person of second chances. Think about it in your own life. Are you a person that gives second chances? We make mistakes. I know I do, right? We make mistakes in our life. Uh, We we hurt people. We do things bad. But we want to be given that second chance, right? We don't want one mistake to ruin us. We don't want to be identified for the rest of our lives by what we did. I grew up in a in a big family, a very big family, and. And you did something, man. You were worried that that was going to stick with you for the rest of your life, right? I mean, it's just like, oh, I'm going to remember that thing that you did, right? That's how I'm going to identify you. But that, that's not what God does. And many can have this mindset. Unfortunately, too many Christians have this mindset that says this. You messed up. You messed with me. I'm drawing that line. You did me wrong. That's it. You had your chance. Aren't we grateful that God gives a second chance and that God didn't say, that's it? Right? We should be people of second chances. As as believers, man, we should be the leaders of second chances. And we should be the leaders of forgiveness. In fact, Jesus made it clear when Peter asked him in Matthew 18, 22, there was this rule, kind of this idea in 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 that time that it was about you forgive somebody three times and then you can check them off the list, right? Okay, but Peter steps up and he goes, Jesus, how about seven times? He's probably popping his collar a little bit, acting all tough in front of Jesus. And Jesus says, not seven times, but seven times 70. He's not giving him a number to say, just do your little you know, checklist. Maybe once you get to seven times 70, you're done. No, Jesus is saying unlimited, like I'm doing for you, you, you forgive. And I want to just encourage us as believers, as the church, as people that are trying to reach Tucson with the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ, we need to be people of second chances and forgiveness. Amen? The third point here is this. If you have never given your life to Jesus, if you have never said, Jesus, you are Lord of my life, if you have not received his salvation from your sins, if you have felt his call on your life, whether you're sitting there listening to the radio or your mom or your dad or your sister or even your kids talk about Jesus and you just kind of reject it, right? You get that feeling in your like, man, I know Jesus is what I need, but you reject it. He's still there, right? He is still there. Respond to his call. Respond to his call if you don't know Christ. So the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying this in verse 2. Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. So the first time we know that Jonah ran from God and from his will. The known will of God. And God again tells Jonah, get up, go to Nineveh, and proclaim to them the message that I have for them. So what does Jonah do? Verse 3 says this, So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. And Jonah at this time, he hears God. He heard him the first time, but he hears him this time. And he knows he's getting that second chance, and he gets up and he goes. He is following God's will. Anybody know the song, I Will Follow? Right, he goes, where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow you. Right, it's a, it's, I, I love that song. Right, I mean, it's just, think about that. When you think about 
what our life is to look like. Man, when Jesus says go, we should go, right? When Jesus says stay, you stay. When he says move, you move because we follow him. And whether we're hearing God for the first, second, or maybe it's the 15th time, especially as for us guys, where we're hard-headed, right? Sometimes it takes our wives 15 times that we get something, right? So, so God's helping us out a little bit on our 15th time. Follow him, right? Stop what you're doing. Listen to him and respond to him, to his will and his way. Now, if you guys, some of you, most of you guys know Jessica and I's history. Uh, Jessica and I, from Kansas City, Missouri, we knew that God was calling us to plant a church. He made that very clear to us. Planting a church just means, man, we just, we're starting a new church in an area that is hurting for churches. And right now we are one church that is reaching a target area of 20,000 people that do not have a church. And we're in a church that is completely unchurched. Right? There's some people here that live in my neighborhood. Just, not even counting just Christian churches, just any kind of church. Less than 4% of the people in Sycamore Park go to church. Less than 7% of people in Tucson go to church, right? So this is the mission field. But let's go back to Jessica and I's call to come here. We didn't know everything that church planning entailed. And maybe God did that for a reason, right? Because there are joys, but I'm going to tell you there's hardships, right? It's difficult, but there's also these awesome joys. We didn't even know the location we were going to. We were, we were wrapped up that we were going to stay in Kansas City and we were going to start a new church there. But God made it clear to us that Tucson was the mission field for us to be in. Even the house that we were in. I mean, it, everything about the way that God moved us here was amazing. And this is the city and the people that he wanted us to serve in right here. This is the school he wanted us to meet in. And you guys are here for a reason. You are the people he wanted us to serve alongside with. Man, we don't do this alone, right? Man, this isn't like just uh, just Jessica and I coming out here and being like super missionaries. Man, we need everybody. We need believers that already know Jesus to stand up, and we need to introduce people to Christ so they can join. And there was a kind of a, a fight, a frustration inside of me because my comf- my my comfortableness is that a word? Comfortableness. Where I was comfortable at was Kansas City. I'm up here. Whatever I say is a word, okay? I'm just, but our, our family, our friends, familiar surroundings, right? In Kansas City, I worked with, at part of my job, I worked with 52 churches. We knew what the spiritual atmosphere was, right? We knew what the, what the culture was like. And, and we, we and had been working with that for a while. But, the, but God said, Tucson. And we surrendered to God's will and to God's way. And as I was struggling with where we were to go, I ended up writing a song, writing out words to a song that illustrated some of my fears and also my willingness to follow. Just me. I mean, Jessica and I, we both had our own battles on on when and where and how and all that other stuff. But this is what I wrote out. I want to give you my all, to give you all of me, to follow your call and to see as you see. Yet here I am, afraid to move my feet, knowing I will fall, appearing to be weak. But here I am, here's my offering, just as I am. Lord, use me, this I plea. Here I am, here's my offering, just as I am. Lord, use my hands and feet. That's the that's the gist of the psalm. But it walks through what I was dealing with internally. I wanted to be obedient to God, right? Once I decided I wanted to be obedient to God, right? But, But I wanted to, but I was scared. I'd been successful in a lot of things in life. I'm coming down to an area where less than 7% of the people even care about church. This isn't an easy place. You get what I'm saying? I mean, there's fears, right? And you, you go out, especially for us guys that are all tough and man, we don't want to mess up. We don't want to fail. I don't want to drive my family 20 hours away and end up moving back a year later because something didn't work out, right? But we have to trust God. And that's what that song was to me. That song was just saying, it's just a personal song of worship that just says, here I am, God, just use me. I'm not going to be able to do it on my own. You do it, right? And we need to live that in our lives sometimes. And it's not always easy to do, uh, to let God use us that way. Sometimes it's counter, actually most of the time it is counter culture to what the world tells us, right? Man, but I want to challenge you guys today to hear God and to follow His will in your life. We all have our wills, right? 
right? We all have our own wills, but God's is bigger. God's is better. In this verse, we see another example of God's sovereignty. We know that God controls nature. He's the creator of all things. He's the sustainer. He controlled the fish. He controlled the sea. And here we see the sovereignty of God and the instructions to proclaim his message that Jonah would give. And Jonah was to communicate, check this out, the word of the Lord, right? Not his own words, not his own words. And I don't, I, I try not to be a distraction, but every time right before I come up to preach, I sit down for a little bit and I pray and I'm preparing my heart and God use me, use the words. And here's one thing that I, that I'm repetitive on and I really believe God, if there's something in my notes that you don't want me to say, skip over it, right? Help me skip over it. If there's something you want me to say, make it clear to me because I'm here to preach your word, not mine. I'm here to preach out of the Bible, not Jeff's book, right? Amen. We need to be faithful to the word of God and notice that God calls Nineveh a great city, right? Check this out. He's given this word and now he's he's calling Nineveh a great city. And many scholars, this is just some free hermeneutics type stuff here. Many scholars have, have debated with the true meaning of what this passage means. Is it speaking of its size, its powers? I believe it, it, it focuses, um, it's speaking of, I believe with a lot of many other scholars that it's speaking of the importance of the city, the importance in the region, the importance to God. In chapter 4, uh, where we'll go next week, we read that God really cared for these people in this city. Also, there's the mention of a three days walk. When it's not 100% clear on what that means, I do believe it's in reference to the time it took to visit the city and it's outlining, you know, areas. In Kansas City, you know, Kansas City wasn't just Kansas City. You had, Tucson doesn't really have this a whole lot, I don't think. I guess it kind of does. You got Tucson and, thanks, Tucson and Vail and Rita Ranch and Marana and those kind of, you get what I'm saying? They're all kind of, that's kind of what I'm getting at here. Thanks for, thanks for dealing with it. Okay. Thank you. Anyway, uh, the, the, the description clearly points um, to their size, to their importance, and also that it's going to take, this message is going to take time to reach everyone, right? It's going to take time to reach everyone. They don't have Facebook or Skype or, or anything like that. Um, Bill doesn't know this, but uh, Twitter has a new thing on there. I think it's called Periscope where you can live, live feed, like video feed. And, and I did that with their practice this morning. So you did good, man. So, you know, they didn't have that. It was word of mouth. It was letters. That's how they did that. In verse 4, here we go. Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said this. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. I can just imagine him walking into town and he's thinking, okay, I'm going to have to preach a message to these people who are probably going to kill me. Right? I mean, he's he's just getting that into the, in his brain. You, I just think it's going to have to be there. And he's probably thinking, these people are mean, they're cruel, they're disgusting, and they don't like my type. And he's, is he, is he preparing a message, right, that he's going to preach to them? Is he kind of going through, man, let's have, let's have a sermon prep on my, on my journey there. Is that what he's doing? Is he thinking of what kind of sermon that he's going to preach that's going to make them happy? By the way, church, I'm just going to let you know, I'm not always going to preach things that are going to make us happy, right? And we, we see too much of that today. Now, there's a ton in the Word of God that should make us extremely happy. But we can't sugarcoat, right? The, the, the Bible calls for us to do things that is counterculture to this world. And he's, is, is he going through his brain and saying, what will make my audience the happiest, right? Instead of, instead of what God wants them to hear? I heard one pastor say this in his, in his, uh, when he was, uh, preaching on Jonah. And he says this, this pastor says this. He goes, I think Jonah was preparing a three point message. The first, the first step to a happy life was his message to these people of Nineveh. And he says, step one, stop being mean. Nineveh, you're mean. Stop it. Right? That was his first one. Step two, think happy thoughts. Be positive. And step three, don't worry. I don't really think that's what Jonah preached, but that was just, you know, this is a message, right? Jonah's thinking this is a message that they won't get mad at me. I can still get a point across. I can preach about God, but they won't get mad at me. Jonah didn't preach any of that. He had already had his fun running from God, right? He got to, he got to go scuba diving and riding in a fish and all that other good stuff, right? But, but he, he had his chance and he saw where doing what he wanted to do got him. He was now being obedient to God and he shared the message that God gave him to share. 
And that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking. Not, not that we don't want to be happy or hear happy things from the scripture. But, man, we just need to be faithful to the word of God and not just preach things that people are going to want to hear all the time. God wants our life to change to look more like him. And he cried out or proclaimed, Jonah did to these people, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. This 40 days thing is kind of repetitive in church, just give you, or in the Bible. It's got to give you a few examples. Genesis 7, speaking of the flood. Then the flood came upon the earth for 40 days. Exodus, speaking of Moses. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Speaking of Jesus, in Matthew 4, Jesus, Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights. So it's kind of this common occurrence. In 40 days, God will overthrow Nineveh. I think about my parents as I was growing up. They would say this. They would say, you have one week to get this room cleaned. Or, right? And then they'd give you your punishment. Or, you have two hours to get these dishes done. That was my dad's favorite, right? Or maybe I'm going to count to three. How many have heard that? How many have said that, right? How many wives have said that to their husbands? No, well, there you go. One. Your husband's not here. Okay. It's recorded, Isabel. Okay. Isn't it funny how we wait until the last day of the week to get our room clean? Right? Or... Or we wait until we have 30 minutes left to get the dishes even started. I despise dishes. Anybody else with me? Can I get an amen? Thank you. Man, I just do not like dishes. And I would wait till the last minute to do the dishes. Or I can remember, I know I'm the only one that ever did this. I would wait until two and a half seconds before I did whatever I was supposed to do, right? I'm the only one that's done that one, right? Why do we do that? Why do we wait? We know we're supposed to do something. Why do we wait? If God is asking you to do something, are you waiting until the very last moment to do it? I've shared the gospel with people and people have said, I've got time to, 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 to accept Jesus. I've got time to give Jesus my life. I want to do certain things. They're like control words, right? They're control words. Are we waiting to change our life or repent of a lifestyle we shouldn't be living? And I really do think it's a matter of control. It's like, oh, you know, I'm going to do this. You gave me 40 days. I'm going to decide which day in the 40 I'm going to do it. Right? I mean, we just kind of have that control thing. Stop it. Right? Me too. We need to stop that. We just need to give it to God. Once we know what God wants us to do, let's do it. When you have that moment where it's clear, do it. And what does Nineveh do with this message? And some might think because they're evil and they're power hungry and they're cruel and they're mean and nasty people that they're going to wait till like the 39th and a half day. We read something really incredible in verse 5. The Bible says this, after this proclamation, Then the people of Nineveh believed in God. The text states that they that, that believed is trusted or believed in God. And in doing so, they believed in God's message to them. Also note this, it doesn't state that they believed in Jonah. Right? Like when I'm up here, I'm not a prophet, right? But when I'm up here preaching, I I do want you to trust me. I do want you to believe what I'm saying, but I don't want you to like eternally believe me. That belief goes in God. That trust goes in God. Amen? Amen? Getting all worked up already. Okay. We read, I already said that part. Okay. The goal for Jonah, the goal for us as we teach and we preach is to believe in God and his message. Not to believe in me, not to believe in your life group or Sunday school or children's workers or anything like that, but to believe in God. And I love reading this, how God uses Jonah. Remember, we just talked about how he literally ran from God. And now God is using Jonah Have you guys ever felt like you are not qualified to do God's work? God, I'm not qualified to pray in front of people. God, I'm not qualified to teach children. God, I'm not qualified to go and share Jesus with people. God, I'm not qualified to do blah, whatever it is, right? I can't imagine that Jonah was feeling any different, right? I messed up, but God is, remember that second chance. 
Look how God uses Jonah. We saw in chapter 1, even when he was being rebellious, God used Jonah. In chapter 1 with the sailors, they were calling out to their own God. They're false gods. They were not followers of God, but they responded to God and they worshipped him. In, in this chapter, uh, the city, the people of Nineveh, they were, they were evil. They were cruel. They were a godless city. They responded and heard and believed in God. God used Jonah, a running and reluctant prophet, a prophet that didn't follow God the first time around, but God used him to turn these sailors and the city to him. Our job at Authentic Life Church is, yes, to grow and equip and to to worship and all those other things, but it's also to go out into Tucson, to Sycamore and Rita and Vail and, and everywhere throughout Tucson and point people to Jesus. Amen? We don't point him to ourselves. We point him to Jesus. We point him to Jesus. And this is the power of God. Let him use you where you are. Man, if you're a person that says, man, I don't know much about the Bible. Well, God can still use you. But two, learn more about the Bible, right? I mean, just think about that. I mean, there's a, there's a way to, to, to do that. But let God use you. Verse 5 says this. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Fasting and wearing sackcloth is a sign of repentance, right? And and a sign that they wanted to hear God and to turn to God. These people believed in God in his warning and word to them and they repented. That's crazy. Thinking about who these people were and just immediately they did this. Let me give you, let me give you some thoughts here. Can you imagine you go into Hollywood, right? And you preach the word of God to them. You get all these actors and actresses and producers and, and all these really famous people out there, right? And you, you preach the word of God to them and immediately they turn from their sinful ways and become followers of Jesus Christ. By the way, I'm not saying that people in Hollywood don't know Jesus, but the, the, the culture is not Jesus, right? It's not of God. Or maybe, maybe this. How about we, we, we go to a meeting where Stephen Hawkins is at? Right? And we preach the word of God and immediately he turns away from his worldview, his ideal system, and turns to God. Woo! Right? That's gonna take the power of God, right? And maybe we go into the middle of a terrorist camp. We go into the middle of a terrorist camp where they kill people just for not saying that they won't deny Christ. Right? And you preach the word of God to them and immediately they turn from their wicked ways and they believe in God. Church, God is capable of this. Do you believe it? He is capable of that, church. We need to preach the word of God. We need to preach his word and not ours. He alone is capable of this transformation. And he proves that here with Jonah. They believe in God and they repent. By the way, I want to throw this out there. Repent is not a bad word. It's a word that we don't like to use in America because it means we're wrong on something. Right? Get over it, right? Jeff, get over it. You know, Jeff, you mess up sometimes. Repent. It's just simply, you're, you're headed this way in sin. Repent just means to turn away from, right? So let's, let's not look at that as a bad word when we use that throughout the, the rest of the, the sermon. Look at verse 6 through 9 with me. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat on the ashes. Notice here, church, that even the king, the leader of these people, the guy that's in charge of all this cruelty... Right? Exchanges his role, uh, his, his royal robe for sackcloth. Man, that's powerful, right? He issued a proclamation and it said this In Nineveh, by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd, or flock taste a thing. Talking about fasting, do not let them eat or drink water, but both men and beast be covered with sackcloth. Both the people and the animals. He, he's, man, they're just. They just want it all covered, right? Let's just get it all done. All the, 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 the beast and, and the people, they're fasting. They're serious about this. They want to hear from God. And going on, and let men call on God earnestly that each, check out that word, each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. The king 
gets up there, the ruler of this cruel nation or the city calls on true repentance to God. He calls on each person to earnestly call on God, to turn away from their wickedness, away from the, from the, the wrong that they're doing and turn to the Almighty God. Verse 9 says this, Who knows, the king is saying this, Who knows, God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. Jonah's proclamation has moved. Let me say this. God's proclamation through Jonah has moved the people of Nineveh to humble themselves and to seek a divine mercy, a, a, to seek God's mercy. What a great thing for Jonah to witness. And what a great thing for us to, to see and read and witness. When we're caught up in things in our lives that aren't pleasing to God, If we know God, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us that that lets us know that. Do we stop immediately and call upon God earnestly? Or do we continue in that? When we hear the will of God, when we read the Bible, do we act accordingly? Do we change our step? Right? Or do we continue to run? A godless city here. Examples a personal and a city-wide heart of repentance. It is possible, church. Then in verse 10, when God saw their deeds and they turned from their wicked ways, then God relented concerning the calamity which He had declared He would bring upon them and He did not do it. God saw the genuineness of their repentance and their actions. These fruits of their repentance moved God to withhold the judgment that He would have sent on them if they had continued in their wicked ways. And I just said this, but repentance is essentially a change in one's thinking and a change in one's direction to turn away. Change in one's behavior indicates that repentance has actually taken place. Many of us have experienced people come to us and say, we're sorry. Right? But their actions show different. They don't change. Words and no actions. And God is calling us, all of us, not just Nineveh. He calls all of us to repentance. He calls all of us to follow Him. A change of mind and a change of heart is necessary, both. We see that the people of Nineveh truly believed and truly repented. Someone asked me a question. Some of you guys have heard the story, but I'm going to share it because it's way fitting here. And I don't know if that's proper English, but it is right now, right? He asked me if there was something I would love to see happen. That would require God to make it happen. I didn't even have to, I didn't even have to think because I'd already been thinking about it. And I told him there was. I shared with him that I now live in a city that the vast majority of people don't, don't know or care about Christ. They're not saved. They're lost in their sin. They are destined for hell. Church, hear me say this. The Bible teaches hell is real. They have no hope. And I shared with him that I would love to see this, t- this city turned upside down with the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ. I told him that's my desire, that I would love to see that. I want to see this city open to the gospel, to run to Jesus, to experience the love and the life that only Jesus can give them. Not that authentic life can give them, or Pastor Jeff, or Jessica, or Levi, or any of us could give them, but Jesus could give them, right? That's what, I'm, that's what I want. I want, I want the, the city of Tucson to experience that. The truth is this, church. God can do that. Do you believe it? God can do that. I recently read this. Actually, I've read this many times. You've probably heard this. There is no true revival without true repentance. This revival that I'm thinking of as being of this city turning to God. The church, the Bible, the gospel become important and valued in people's lives. Darkness and Satan are losing out and people are turning to the love of Jesus Christ. I want to see this church. I want to be a power or a part of the power of God. I want to be one of His lights shining. Not my light, but His light shining in the city. I would love to see Satan and darkness lose. For Satan's influence to be weakened and then defeated. And for Christ's influence and love to win and overwhelm this city. Woo! Right? Let's get excited about that. How different would this place look? But church, 
with Christians and with people that don't know Jesus, repentance is a must. A change of mind, a change of direction, a change of heart. Church, I I need you to desire this with me. This isn't a Jeff and Jessica show. Or Dan show, or a Bill show, or a Chris, or whoever, right? Hey, Mike. This is not a Mike show. I need you guys to desire this with me. The Bible talks about compassion. Jesus has compassion on, on, on people that are lost. And this compassion is, is a gut-wrenching love and pain for people. This isn't just like, oh, I love chocolate, right? No, this is a life-changing love. And we need to desire this. We need to have compassion for the lost in this city. We need to ache for those that do not know Jesus as their Savior. We need to know that people here are lost and, 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 and they're headed to a place called hell. Eternity without Christ. When I think about the spiritual condition of this church, authentic life church, man, I... Like in my own life, there's there's positives, there's there's ups and downs, right? And I, but I am encouraged by many that I see here that their lives are being changed. Lives are turning to Christ, chasing after His wisdom and His truth and the Word of God in His ways. They're being obedient to Him. They're being disciples. They're sharing Jesus with people. They're sharing Jesus with those that God has placed in their lives, and sometimes it's their families. And I love getting those cards. And church, know that when you put prayer requests on those cards, by the way, you can put them in the offering plate if you have some. I pray for those. And I love seeing them. God, help me help me be an influential person at work for Jesus Christ. Help me, help me father and, and mother or teach and husband and all that other stuff. My family for Jesus Christ. Right? Lives are being changed. I love it. It's happening at Authentic Life. Is it happening in your life? Throw the big picture out, like the big, the big group. Is it happening in your life? Are you seeking God? Are you chasing Him? Are you being obedient? Are you sharing the gospel with people that are next to you in line? At, 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 I don't know, that's kind of scary, right? Sharing, have, you, have anybody ever seen that, where people just share Jesus in a line at a grocery store? That's really awesome. I get kind of scared sometimes, like my knees shake a little bit, but that's really awesome. Are we sharing Jesus with people? Are we in His will? Are we doing what He wants us to do? Church, are we living a life? That is pleasing to God. When Nineveh repented, the leaders, the people, they repented. The king called on each individual to call upon the Lord. He called on each one to repent, to hear the Lord, to be obedient. He called on each person to have a change of heart. Today, I'm no king. I'm nobody special. Levi is. He's getting a phone call. Right? (laughs) Sorry, brother. But I want to tell you this today, church, as your pastor. Let's live a life that is pleasing to God. To repent of sins in our life. My goal is to live a life of daily repentance. I, I, you guys, you may very well may be one that only sins like every three days, right? But Bill, I'm with you, man. It seems like constantly. We have to turn back to Jesus. That's what repentance is. And I pray that you guys would join me as I pray for our church, for our city, that we would call on the Lord, that we would seek His will and not our own. And I know it starts with me. But it's not just me. It's all of us. We are Authentic Life Church. We are the local body of Jesus Christ here in Tucson. We are the church. We are followers of Jesus Christ. And I want to say this. Right now, immediately, urgently, earnestly, we need to be calling on God. We need to bring our sin to Him, our shortfallings to Him, to ask Him to guide us, to ask Him to use us, to ask Him to help us hear Him clearly and be obedient. Now I'm going to ask you guys to do something that's not normal here at Authentic Life. But it's needed and it's necessary and I'm going to ask you to do it. I want to ask you guys to join me today as a church, as a body, to pray with me, to to, to bring God our sins, to bring God, just to turn our heart towards Him, to bring Him our concerns and our worries, to repent, church. Let's be one as a church and call out to God. 
We need to cry out to God, this world, church, this city needs Jesus. And our life must be looking like his. Let us allow God to use us and to change us. So I want to ask you guys to, to come forward. And, and you don't, if, you're, if you're uncomfortable with that, that's fine. Just pray in your chair. But I would love for you guys to come forward and join with me and just pray quietly. And the reason that we come forward is because it's a step of faith. It's a step of, of showing unity within the church and unity within God. And we just come forward and we just pray. And we pray that, that we as individuals would turn to God, that we as individuals would repent, that we as individuals would listen to him and do as what he's called us to do. And then once, after a few minutes, I will, I will close us in prayer and then we can go back to our seats. But if you guys could, Josh, if you could go ahead and do that now. If you guys would join me in a time of prayer, I would greatly appreciate it.